Folks, this is the Zephyrus Duo SE by ROG, and it's by far the most unique laptop that I've ever taken a look at. Let me explain. You see, laptops are generally portable devices that enable you to take your work with you anywhere you go. Now, we've covered numerous laptops here on the channel, and while many of them have surprised us by their amazing performance, uh, especially with AMD's new uh, Ryzen 5000 8 series of processors, not a single one of them gave me that wow factor. You know, it's like so cool kind of thing because laptops were just laptops. I mean, manufacturers were just going with the whole, if it ain't broke, don't fix it type of approach until Asus announced the Duo series. Now, this isn't the first Duo laptop. You may recall the ZenBook Duo, which was launched back in 2019. Uh, and ever since then, customers have been giving valuable feedback to see what improvements uh, could be made to refine the user experience. And here we are with another dual screen laptop from ROG, which happens to have gaming DNA, of course. And it also happens to have the Ryzen 9 5900HX and an RTX 3080, which is just incredible. It's the best specs that you can find right now on a laptop. So allow me to share my experience with the Zephyrus Duo SE by ROG. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. Don't have the time to wait for parts and build your own gaming PC? NZXT Build has your back. Navigate through their simple UI, choose the games you want to play, pick a budget that works, and the configurator will do its magic by offering some options built just for you. Or choose from one of their awesome pre-built setups. Want something more custom? Go crazy building your own dream PC from the ground up. All of these are backed with a two-year all-in-one warranty on parts, labor, and RAM overclocking. Save your time and start gaming right away with NZXT Build. Check it out down below. Okay, so let's start with that second screen, which Asus is calling ROG ScreenPad Plus. I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions like, you know, how does it work? Does it affect the way how you traditionally use a laptop for productivity and gaming tasks? Most importantly, is it a practical solution these days? Well, the screen opens up at a 13 degree angle when you open the primary display and it's integrated really well. What really surprised me was how they were able to maintain a relatively slim profile at just 0.82 inches, roughly 20 millimeters. So this will easily fit your backpack just like any other 15 inch laptop. Uh, to give you a little bit of context, it's only 0.04 inches thicker than the ROG Zephyrus G15 that I checked out recently. However, you will have to compromise on the weight of this laptop because it's around 2.5 kilos, which is 600 grams heavier than the G15. And I felt that right away when I started handling uh, this machine. The screen itself is pretty amazing. The resolution is 3840 by 1100, which is aligned perfectly with the 3840 by 2160 resolution on the primary screen. So it's really sharp. Uh, so when you move apps between two displays, you won't notice any weird scaling issues. Uh, it's seamless and I absolutely love it. I also appreciate the matte texture, which cuts off a lot of the reflections. Uh, plus it features touch support, so you can interact with your content uh, in a more lively manner. There are a few configurations that you can go for uh, for the primary display in terms of resolution. Uh, the first option is 1080p at 300 hertz, but keep in mind that it only covers 100% sRGB. The sample that I have over here uh, features 4K at 120 hertz. And for my display analysis test, it covers 100% sRGB, 99% Adobe RGB, and 93% DCI-P3. So it's an incredibly color accurate display with stunning visuals. So if you're a content creator and a gamer, this is probably the best of both worlds that you can ask for. Now, I did wish if it got brighter because for my test, it was only able to hit 380 nits of peak level. Um, also by default, when you unplug uh, this laptop, the screen switches automatically to 60 hertz to preserve battery, uh, but you can actually change that through the settings to 120 hertz if you want to run it full time, but that's obviously going to drain battery life. Now, if you're wondering about the color accuracy of that second screen, I did run my test, but it's actually not as good as the primary display. As you can see, it only covers 100% sRGB, 76% Adobe RGB, and 79% DCI-P3, which is still respectable in my opinion. Brightness levels are pretty much on par with the main display. Uh, I got around 380 nits uh, at its peak setting, so it's pretty consistent and that's awesome. So what I'm gonna do right now is jump into a quick demo for you guys to show uh, some of the optimizations that Asus has done with this second display and some creative applications. All right, so the first app that I wanna showcase is Adobe Premiere Pro. Now, Asus's screen expert utility, which is this control center that you're seeing right over here, does support some of Adobe's applications. The first thing I can do is adjust the time axis. So if I want precise control over where I wanna make my cut, I can certainly do that by just simply playing around with that. 
or if I want to zoom into my timeline or zoom out to my, out of my timeline, I can use this little knob over here with this screen knob uh, to do so in a really nice and seamless way, which works really well. You can actually customize and rearrange these uh, by just going through the control uh, panel, which uh, can be checked out right over here. Uh, you can adjust the volume uh, playback level, which is pretty awesome. And of course, you have undo, redo, and if I want to simply cut things here and there. You know, it's handy, and quite frankly, it is a new workflow that you have to get used to, especially because with Adobe Premiere Pro, you can actually program a lot of these keys on the keyboard itself to do a lot of these functions, but now you have that extra sort of versatility. Unfortunately, with this setting or with this control panel, you can't necessarily map this to a specific command that you like for this particular program. It's very limited, so that's something to keep note of. Now I want to switch gears into Adobe Photoshop. As you can see, I have a thumbnail project ready to go, and the layout has actually changed on the control panel. So now you can uh, zoom in to the actual frame if you want to do that. Uh, it's not necessarily as smooth. Uh, there is a little bit of delay, so that's something that you'll have to get used to. And then, of course, you can change a few things like your brush size, your brush flow, and undo, redo, and reprogram and map all these things. I actually prefer having these buttons over here because if I want to quickly you know, choose the hand tool, I've got my hand tool to simply move around the image just like that. And if I want to quickly erase something, I can just you know, click a layer and then start erasing certain things off the image just like that. So it's very simple. Next up, we have Adobe Lightroom. And as you can see, the layout has changed once again, but it honestly works really well with this application. So check this out. I can zoom into the frame and zoom out, and it works pretty well. But the cool thing is I can actually adjust contrast. I can play around with the exposure. I can you know, adjust the black levels, the saturation, if I want to boost that up, play around with the highlights, the shadows, the white levels, and of course, increase the clarity to just make that pop out. And it all can be done on the fly, and it's so seamless instead of fiddling around with these things using your mouse. This is honestly my favorite thing about this particular application. The only thing to watch out for if you, is if you want to adjust the color temperature, and if you just play around with that, it's completely going to mess up that. There's just no real-time adjustments. Once you play around with this, your image is going to look like trash. So I would highly stay away from that temperature slider. Uh, I think the same thing goes for tint as well. So yeah, so this last application I want to showcase is DaVinci Resolve. Now I have enabled the dual screen layout by default, uh, just because with DaVinci Resolve, it actually spans across your secondary display. So if you want to go through your imported footage, you can simply do that right over here, you get a nice live preview. And then you can drag and drop it right away into your main timeline, which is awesome. You also have your uh, video transitions and your audio effects and all that stuff right over here. And you can simply just drag and drop this into your timeline. And it works really, really well. Very seamless. I love this sort of integration. I also want to quickly showcase what you can do with window management. So if you have a bunch of windows in your main display, and if you want to maximize or snap them onto your secondary display, you can simply grab your window from the main display. And then there's a little pop-up menu that shows up, and then you can simply snap it onto your secondary display like that, or you can span it across both screens. So if I show you this feature right over here, boom, it snaps onto that second display, and now you can just go through all the content on your second screen. But if you want to actually span this, let's say this one you know, Hardware Connects web page that I have open here, I can just span that across the entire screen, and right there you have that seamless kind of flow. I should also mention that that pop-up menu that I just mentioned earlier will allow you to snap this into three different uh, windows just like this right over here. So now you have three separate windows. So you can have your Discord app over here, maybe something over here, maybe like Spotify or maybe something else right over there. So you can sort of multitask in such a way, which is uh, kind of neat. All right, so now you're aware of some of the ins and outs of the second screen. I just want to go over a few things. The first thing being the durability of the second screen and that hinge. Uh, it's actually pretty strong, and it doesn't flex when you're interacting with the display. Underneath that, there are a few intake fans for cool air to get to the components inside, and then it exhausts out the back and the sides. Just keep in mind that when you're closing the display uh, to keep clear of anything that might get in the way between the second screen and the body. Uh, now, there are a few things that I also want to point out regarding the second screen. Uh, the first thing being that 13 degree angle, because in my opinion, I wish if it was able to elevate just a little bit more because 
when I'm looking or when I'm looking down right at that screen, I actually notice some real fatigue on my neck because I'm constantly looking down instead of that main display. Uh, so that's certainly something to keep note of. If you can find a laptop stand that can elevate the laptop, something like that, uh, then it will be pretty nice because you now have both screens uh, within your peripheral vision. So it's easier to sort of switch back and forth. Uh, but that's again, something that you'll have to consider uh, if you're planning on getting this. So with all of that out of the way, I think it's time to discuss the other areas that get affected by this second screen implementation. And the first one is obviously the keyboard. Asus had to shift it all the way at the bottom to make room for the display. And that instantly affects the typing experience for laptop, especially if you take it everywhere you go. There isn't any room for your palms to rest. So when you have this on your lap, uh, it's certainly gonna cause a great level of discomfort. Not only that, the trackpad is positioned to the bottom right-hand side and it's really small to a point where you're just forced to use a dedicated mouse. Now they do include a palm rest in the box for a better typing position, but uh, it's only practical if you use this thing on a desk 90% of the time. And keep in mind that this layout will take up a larger portion of your desk. So if you're working within compact spaces, then this whole thing is gonna be a problem. The keys themselves are pretty good. The travel distance is shorter compared to the G15, but it gets the job done and it features Aura RGB lighting and you can adjust the lighting effects through the Armory Crate software. There is a numpad integrated within the trackpad and you can enable that by simply holding this button over here. The keys above that can be used to activate Armory Crate, disable the second display, and of course, powering on the laptop. Now, if you look at the overall design of the Duo SC, I really like how stealth it looks. Uh, the top lid is wrapped with a combination of magnesium and aluminum compound, and it does a really good job resisting fingerprints. Um, this is honestly by far the best finish that I've ever come across on a laptop. I think Asus just knocked it out of the park. Great job, guys. Port selection is pretty respectable for the Duo SC. So on the left-hand side, you have power in, audio jack, and a micro SD card reader, which honestly doesn't make any sense for a laptop in this price range, especially if it's geared towards creators as well, because a lot of them shoot with cameras that take regular SD cards, including myself, but I'm limited to this. I actually can't use this, which is unfortunate. Switching over to the right-hand side, you get a USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-C port, which also support PD charging uh, up to 100 watts and display port output. You also have two USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-A ports. Interestingly enough, there are a few more ports at the back, like an RJ45 jack, another USB Type-A port, uh, and an HDMI port. I just wished if Asus relocated the power connector over to the back because it would have made cable management a lot more easier and you wouldn't have to sort of extend that all the way uh, right over here, which does get a little frustrating at times. As for gaming on dual screens, well, I didn't really find anything beneficial about having both on at the same time other than having a messenger app enabled, but that actually ended up being distracting to be honest. And I wish the games I played a lot for player stats and other info on the lower screen but I'm hoping that ASUS can work uh, with some developers to make that happen. I should also mention that this laptop does not come with a webcam. Uh, for me, that's kind of unacceptable considering how expensive this thing costs, but I'm gonna let you guys take uh, the call on that. Whether or not if it's a deal breaker or not, that's totally up to you guys. In terms of upgradability, you have quick access to one memory slot, which as you can see is already populated. Maximum supported memory is only up to 32 gigabytes. Uh, there are two M.2 slots, which are also populated on my sample, and ASUS has configured these drives in a RAID 0 setup. The Duo SC has a 90 watt hour battery, and it does face some challenges when it comes to battery life. The extra power overhead needed for two screens and the GPU resources to run them means pretty poor battery life with both turned on. But turn the secondary screen off and things do improve a bit for web browsing. Switching to a heavier load and you can see the negative effects of ASUS using a higher wattage Ryzen CPU. Even with the screen off and the processor being throttled into a lower performance mode, it won't even hit two hours. And if you're looking for a combination of battery life, portability and performance, the G15 is a much better option, while the Duo really focuses on purely raw performance. So before I get into the performance results of the Duo SC, I do wanna quickly talk about pricing. Now, obviously given how feature rich this laptop is, expect a very hefty price tag. It starts at $2,200, and for that you get a Ryzen 7 5800H, 16 gigabytes of RAM, a terabyte SSD, 1080p display, and an RTX 3060. The sample that I have over here that's fully loaded with a Ryzen 9 5900HX, 32 gigabytes of RAM, two terabytes of SSD storage, a 4K screen, and an RTX 3080 goes for 3,700 US dollars. And you know what's really disappointing? 
Even if you had that kind of money burning in your pocket, you can't physically buy one, at least at the time I'm making this video, because it's out of stock everywhere. Even here in Canada, I found one in stock here in Brampton, but I mean, like, we did reach out to ASUS to see what this whole situation is all about, and they did tell us that they are planning on restocking some of these samples, but, uh, you know, right now, this thing is just really rare to find. Now, there could be a few reasons behind this. Either AMD is scrambling around trying to produce these processors, or since people can't buy components for their gaming desktops, they are more leaning towards buying gaming laptops. And I hate to say this, miners too. You see, the Duo SE has a super fast GPU, and that means pretty decent hash rate as well. So it's really frustrating. I totally get it. But we are living in a very sad reality, especially when it comes to the crazy component madness. It's it's really sad. So with all of that taken into account, let's take a look at performance. At first glance, these results might not look all that impressive, but we do have to remember two things. First, the Duo is packing a higher wattage 5000 series CPU than any other laptop we've seen so far. Secondly, Zen 3 and even Zen 2 were always designed to operate at higher temperatures than Intel chips. So what might look like a worrying temperature actually isn't one. Clock speeds in performance and turbo modes are pretty crazy with both leveling out above 4 gigahertz under all core load. Performance does have a bit of a wave-like profile, but there's nothing concerning here at all. The power profiles run just from 20 watts in silent mode all the way up to a constant 87 watts in turbo mode, which is basically as much as desktop CPU sucks down these days. Performance mode has the best of both worlds, which is why we use it in all of our testing. And it's super impressive to see this on a laptop, guys. And let's see how that leads into performance. Now, as I go through these results, it's pretty obvious that running the CPU at such high clock speeds has some serious benefits for performance. In most apps, this is simply the fastest laptop we've ever tested. Sure, there are some situations where it doesn't come out on top, but it's still very much near desktop level performance. The only real areas where the flagship last gen Intel CPU win out are in Premiere Pro and DaVinci Resolve. Both of those seem to really like the way Intel's cores handle lightly threaded workloads. Switching things over to the RTX 3080, and it looks like we'll finally see what happens with this GPU when it's pushed to over 115 watts. I mean, just look at this thing. An average of 117 watts in performance mode and 124 watts in turbo, all in a pretty slim chassis is amazing. And silent, well, that just cuts power to just 90 watts. Now that higher input power leads to clock speeds that are right near the top of NVIDIA's RTX 3080 specs. But what's more interesting to me is how the silent setting eats down about 90 watts, but only hits 990 megahertz. I would have expected at least a bit higher speeds for that kind of investment. And when you look at temperatures, well, performance mode gets pretty toasty around 96 degrees Celsius, but it's also obvious ASUS is sacrificing thermals for frequencies here, and silent remains pretty cool too. But even though turbo has the highest speeds and power input, it also gets the lowest temps. And that's because in performance mode, the system actually allows temperatures to go higher, but that also means lower fan speeds, while turbo mode, it just goes all the way out and it gets really loud to be honest. Silent is pretty much whisper quiet, which is what you'd expect for that mode. Gaming performance shows what we've come to expect from the Zephyrus Duo SE. It's the fastest thing on the block in most situations, but it's still amazing to see the last generation RTX 2080 Super keeping up so well. Personally, I think this might be due to the CPU bottlenecking at 1080p, but we'll just have to see what happens as time goes on and as we test more laptops with high resolution displays. Speaking of which, the Duo still delivers super playable frame rates at 1440p, which is good news for anyone who wants to push the internal display a bit further. And given this is the first gaming laptop we've tested with a native 4K display, these results that you're seeing here are almost desktop level numbers. Right across the board, this thing doesn't have any hard time playing games at 4K. So the Duo SC has pretty much everything. Insane performance, a super unique screen layout, good connectivity, and some really interesting features as well. But are there sacrifices to get that super cool design? Absolutely. I mean, the keyboard and trackpad are in a super awkward position. The secondary screen never hits an optimal angle for viewing, and there's the price. It's just really, really expensive. I mean, the benefits of dual screen laptop really aren't that great for gaming, but if you are a content creator, it definitely comes in handy. So just like I mentioned in the beginning of this video, I think the Zephyrus Duo SE is one of the most unique laptops that I've ever taken a look at. And I think it applies to a pretty niche market. And there's nothing wrong with that, provided that you can actually find one, of course. 
So on that note, thank you so much for watching. Let us know what you guys think about the Duo SE from ROG. Are you impressed by its performance? And also, what do you guys think about that second screen? Is there a particular workflow that you might consider taking advantage of? Really curious to know. I'm Ibo with Hardware Canucks. Thank you so much for watching. And uh, I'll talk to you guys in the next one.